natidhanam apanyasa anyanatidhayato iyam hidhanam ca panyata sve nibbana santike there is no concentration without wisdom no wisdom without concentration one who has both wisdom and concentration is close to peace and emancipation As this is a Sutta study retreat, we have selected some discourses to discuss, discuss. Uh, the word Sutta in Pali means uh, it has very profound meaning. We can translate that into English as well said piece of discourse. Well said sutta in Sanskrit su ukta. Ukta means said. Su ukta means well said. Every discourse of the Buddha is well said. And today I decided to discuss one of such discourses which is called Madhu Pindika Sutta in Pali. Madhu Pindika, Madhu means honey. Pindika means bowl. Honey bowl discourse. <laughs> when you listen to it, you will taste honey. That is called, that is why it is called honey ball discourse. The discourse, we have, uh, we have some notes in front of you. I printed the gist of it the summary of this course. The detail is little rep repetitive detail. I avoided details and got the essence, the heart of this course in your notes. When Buddha was in Kapilavattu, one morning, he went for his arms round. After collecting his food, and he sat 
Samya and eating that food he collected and uh, went to a forest nearby and sat under a bilwa tree. Bilwa is a kind of tree he sat under there to spend the day time there in meditation. When he was sitting there, a man, a Brahmin, called Dandapani. Dandapani means one who has a stick in his hand. That means this man used a walking stick, like I do when I walk. With the walking stick, he walked for exercise. And he saw the Buddha sitting under this tree. Dandapani has been to many religious teachers, Jains, and other, there were six different religious teachers, famous at that time. He went to them and learned their teachings. Equipped with this knowledge, he was a little puffed up, very proud, he thought, I know something. That's what happened to people when they know something. And then he went to the Buddha and asked him, what does the secluse assert? What does he proclaim? He knew that this was the Buddha, and his question was, has some derogatory uh, meaning, sort of insulting meaning. Not very friendly question. The undertone is unfriendly, sort of insulting the Buddha. Buddha gave a very simple answer in complicated way in order to humble him, to break his pride. Uh, you can see the Buddha's reply. Uh, in his reply, he said, uh, my teaching I assert uh, such a teaching that among human, divine, Brahmins and all this, I can live without dispute. That was not much of an answer. But there is a very profound answer in this, a meaning in this answer. That means the real meaning of this statement, the Buddha's answer, is that he believes that one who lives life detached from sensual pleasures perplexity, worry, craving for any kind of beings, he can live without quarrel with anybody in the world, with gods, maras, seclush, seclush, brahmins, and brahmas, princes, and whole generations of living beings. That is his explanation. Dandapani was even more confused and he 
put his tongue out and wagged it just to insult him. Like that. And puckered three wrinkles on his forehead. Created three wrinkles on his forehead and went away. Buddha was not upset. Buddha was very profound. He, after spending his time in the on the Belva tree, returned to the monastery, and he repeated this incident. He said to Bhikkhus, Dandapani came. He asked me this question, I answered this way, and this was reaction. His reaction, he went away. Then the monks asked the Buddha, when the verse, uh, what is the meaning of this? Buddha gave them uh, an answer which is even more complicated. He did not give this answer to because to complicate them, but he wanted the bhikkhus to think. The, they, when they asked this question, Buddha said, Bhikkhus, as to the source through which perceptions and so and uh, notion born of mental proliferation beset a man if nothing is found here to delight in, welcome and hold to. This is the end of the underlying tendencies to lust, underlying tendency to aversion, underlying tendency, tendency to views, Underlying tendency to doubt, underlying tendency to conceit, underlying tendency to beings, desire for being, of underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons of quarrels, brawls, disputes, uh, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech here, these evil unwholesome states cease without remained. That was the Buddha's explanation to the monks. Now, Monks then even monks did not understand this answer. Now let us take little one step further and try to understand these words. Here Buddha mentioned seven kind of underlying tendencies. What is the underlying tendencies? They are called tendencies in our minds. Friends, when we listen to the Dhamma, the Buddha's discourses, well-said discourses, we must try to apply them to us. Don't think that these are discourses just for philosophical speculations. These are the discourses that address us, our own mental state. Therefore, whenever we talk about mental uh, underlying tendencies, we must ask ourselves, do we have these underlying tendencies? Whenever we listen to Dhamma, we must think this Dhamma is uh, giving or given to me. Buddha addressed me. Buddha talked to me. 
Therefore, I must look in myself, inside myself, when I listen to this Dhamma. Don't think of anybody else. Ah, Buddha had the so and so. If you remember somebody you don't like, you think, ah, he said about him, about her. That is not the way to listen to Dhamma. We must listen to Dhamma thinking that Buddha talked to me. Buddha talked to me. And he talked to my underlying tendencies. What are my underlying tendencies? Underlying means underlying. Under lie. <laughs> Under what? Under the table, under the roof, eh? there are so many unders. Here under means under our conscious mind, under our conscious mind. Conscious mind, certain things come to conscious mind, then Consciousness begin to work in a certain way. And there are three levels. First level is underlying tendency level, dormant level, inactive level, very sort of sleeping level. That's called Anusaya in Pali. These words are in Pali, Anusaya. Saya means sleeping. Saya means sleeping. Anusaya means sleeping under. Number one. Uh, that is the first stage, Anusaya level. Then, whenever senses and sensory objects come together, consciousness arises, meet in these three, contact arises, then the feeling arises, perception arises, and then underlying tendency begins to activate. In the sixth stage, first stage is eyes, visual objects, number two, three, consciousness, four, contact, five, feeling, and then perception. As soon as we perceive, then underlying tendency activates. It happens so quickly, all these five stages pass so quickly that we cannot identify, isolate any of these stages because it happens so quickly. <coughs> we cannot isolate one of them and Pinpoint, this is such and such. Eyes, visual objects, meeting, consciousness, fe contact, feeling. And then feeling arises on six stages. These six stages happen so quickly, you cannot separate one from another. And that time, as soon as we perceive, then underlying tendency activates. That is stage called pariyuttana. Getting up. You are sleeping. Something happens. You get up. That happens to everybody, everywhere, anytime, all of 
the world. That is called Dhamma is akalika, unaffected by time. It happened in the time of the Buddha, it happened now, it will happen the same way in the future. Now, Pariyutthana stage arises. When Pariyutthana stage arises, Pariyutthana means a getting up. When you get up, you move. Right? When you get up from your bed, you move. <laughs> Likewise, our mind, when this happens, gets up, it's called moving. That is called Viti Kama. Pali word Viti Kama means going, moving. When it is activated, when it, it is activated, it begins to move, do things here and there. That's called Viti Kama. Going in the direction through the eye to think all sort of thoughts arise in the mind. With regard to that form. Then the last stage is called Kamma Patha. Pariyutana Viti Kama Kamma Patha. Four stages. First, activating, getting up. Second, uh, it, first stage is sleeping, then getting up, then moving, then acting. That acting is called Kamma Patha. Committing Kamma. Wholesome or unwholesome or imperturbable karma. So that all start from the mind. That is why Buddha said, Chetanaham Vikre Tamangodana. When you have perception, you think. When you have perception, you think. And then with the thought, you speak. You act. So, see the whole series of activities underground is happening before we utter a word, before we, before we move our hand to do something. Many things has already happened in our mind. They are called, they are called, they are called, they are called underlying tendencies. Underlying tendencies. So, underlying tendency to lust, lust. When the when I see an object, object turns out to be pleasant according to our our way of thinking, because the pleasantness or unpleasantness is not in the object. It is the way we think. According to our thinking, if the object happens to be pleasant, then the lust arises. You don't have to uh, worry about this word, lust, because this is another name for desire. Lust is another name for desire. There are many, many, many words for desire. Thirst, desire, lust, love, you know, liking, uh, and so forth. So many words we use in English. In Pali, there are many more words. But all come from the same root greed, craving, or, or the, this, what you call raga, raga, tanna, and so on. The first underlying tendency is called Raga Anusaya. I said Anusaya, sleeping under Raga Anusaya. Lust, underlying tendency to lust. Or if the object turns out to be unpleasant according to our way of thinking, 
then the underlying tendency to aversion can arise. Aversion can arise. It can be dislike, hate, don't appreciate, or something. We, we can use many words, but the, but the root is one underlying tendency to aversion. Or underlying tendency to views. All kind of views we have. They are all underlying in our subconscious mind. Occasionally we express, most of the time we do not express because we don't have enough powerful vocabulary to express that view. Particularly view with regard to self, I. We don't express sometimes, sometimes we express it. But the tendency is there. And under the tendency to doubt can arise. Underlying tendency to conceit. Conceit means I. I. That capital I. Whenever we express the word capital I, we express the underlying tendency to conceit. I. And this is the word we use more often than any other words in English language or any other language. We know when we listen to a conversation between you and me, I use I more than you use I. Because my ego is better, bigger than your ego. Perhaps you speak you say I more than I do, if your ego is bigger than mine. In conversation, we use this word, I, 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 I. Very carefully, we mindfully, we pay attention to our conversation between us. We, under, we, we see how inadvertently almost unconsciously, we use the word I. That is an expression of conceit, underlying tendency to conceit. Then, another underlying tendency is underlying tendency to, uh, tendency to become bhava, anusaya. <coughs> Uh, becoming. Becoming <coughs> has a very uh, nebulous meaning, unclear meaning. Uh, I want to become popular. That is becoming. I want to become famous. That is becoming. I want to become a writer. That is a becoming. I want to become an author. That's a becoming. I want to become a president. That's a becoming. I want to become a secretary. That is becoming. I want to become a pilot. That is becoming. I want to become a doctor. That is becoming. Becoming, becoming, all kind of becoming. I want to be a professor. Becoming. I want to be a student becoming. I want to become a farmer, becoming. I want to become a householder, becoming. So I want to, want to become, 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 this become, that become, that become. <laughs> Underline tendency. I want to, even after death, I want to become a human. I want to become a divine. I want to become Brahma. After death, while alive, we have so many things to become. 
in this life. <laughs> this is the underlying tendency. From childhood, if you are a child, a child, what are you going to be when you grow up? I want to become a doctor. Child would say. Even the child like this become in tendency. Right? We all have that. I want to become a monk. So I became a monk. <laughs> I want to become a teacher. I became a teacher. I want to become a meditator. I became a meditator. Right? So, that is underlying tendency. And then, underlying tendency into ignorance. That is the last, the most powerful tendency, underlying tendency. So Buddha said in replying, elaborating a little bit his, question, his answer to Dandapani, he said all this. And then monks could not understand the answer. Even though they were living with the Buddha, listening to his Dhamma every day, this answer they could not understand. Then Buddha giving this instructions, I said, because this is the answer, and he got up and went back, went to his kuti. This is another way of the, another teaching technique. That means he allowed monks to discuss. He allowed monks to discuss and get the proper answer. So he got up and went to his uh, kuti and then these monks thought, how can we get this answer cleared? Who can do, who can clear it up for us? Then they thought of Venerable Mahakachana. Mahakachana is uh, one, Buddha himself has uh, mentioned, he, he gave uh, titles to monks. Uh, he selected 80 monks to give monks and nuns, uh, and among monks 80 and nuns also about 80. He selected for specialty. Venerable Mahakachana specialized in elaborating brief statements in detail. Whenever the Buddha gave brief statement, Venerable Mahakachana was able to expand it and clarify it in more detail. So these monks went to Venerable Mahakachana. and uh, presented their problem. Then Mahakachana you, see, you can see Mahakachana's explanation uh, in your note. Mahakachana first was reluctant to say give his answer very quickly. He said, uh, Venerable Monks, you left the Buddha, you should have asked the Buddha to explain this in more detail, uh, but you missed that chance and came to me. I try my best to answer this. When I give my answer, you go back to the Buddha and get it more clarified uh, if Buddha uh, clarified in, in more detail, you accept that. But let me explain the way I understand the Buddha's statement. Then he said, friends, you can see this in your notes. When the Blessed One rose from his seat 
and went into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning. That is, because as, uh, as to this source through which and so forth, he repeated the answer. And then he gave his own explanation. His explanation is, this is where we see the, the eternal truth, uh, Akalika Dhamma, Dhamma that is not affected by time and space, is dependent origination. He said, dependent on I and forms, I consciousness arises. This is what I mentioned earlier. The meeting of these three contact, with contact as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that he one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferated. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notion born of mental proliferation beset a man with regard to past, future and present forms cognizable through the I. That is his. Uh, part of his answer. We went through already senses, in this case I, visual objects is form, eye consciousness, eye contact, feeling and perception. What we perceive, then we begin to think. We begin to think. Think about the forms that we have seen in the past. And we think about the forms that we see now, and we think of the forms that we will see in future. So, with regard to three times past, present and future, with regard to sight, with regard to forms, we begin to think. When we think of the kind of uh, forms that we have seen, then arises mental proliferation. Proliferation means multiplying. When uh, a sperm and over meat embryo begins and from that point onward that tiny little cellular one cellular being multiplies, proliferates and multiplies, 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 multiplies for nine months and then comes out of the womb as the ready-made form. All eyes are in the places where eyes should go, ears are in the places where ears should go, nose in the same place, lips, no teeth, but uh, everything is complete form comes out. And during these nine months, this little embryo proliferated, increased, and we continue to increase. Similarly, whenever we have a tiny little thought of something, of form, then we begin to think of that form. Think of our, our association with the form, 
think of the way we dealt with the form in the past, what we felt about the form, how we spoke with the form. This form can be human, animal, inanimate, animate, inanimate form. So we begin to think. When we begin to think of these forms, we take this one example, then we can go to hearing, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thought, and so forth. We take one example, then we can apply to other five senses as well. When we begin to think of the sight we saw, things we see now, <coughs> things we will see in future, then <coughs> those previous underlying tendencies, as I mentioned earlier, they first were underlying according to the way we saw the object, we experienced, we encountered in our you know, relationship with that object. Then the those seven underlying tendencies will begin to activate. All those seven tendencies, underlying tendencies will begin to activate. They rise, then uh, uh, they move, then uh, commit, come. That can be a, a conversation, a discussion, whatever. And then the person will be will be sucked into that conversation, and this becomes a burden to that person. That kind of uh, mental proliferation can weigh him down. Becomes a, becomes a heavy burden, a drag into the past, the person will be, will be dragged into the present, will be dragged into the future. You see, then he thinks, it is, so he said, when there is I, a form, and so on, it is possible to uh, point out that the manifestation of being, and uh, when there is the manifestation of feeling, it is possible to point out that the manifestation of perception, when there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking, when there is a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of uh, besetment by perception and notion born of mental proliferation. When there is ear and so forth, when all these began to bombard the person, Purpose person is completely sucked into it, or the, to the past thought, present thought, and future thought. So then the solution, when the Mahakatyana said, when there is no I. This is a very important paragraph to remember. When there is no I, no form, no I consciousness, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of contact. Now, the whole series of things it mentioned there, let me read the whole thing and then explain. When there is no manifestation of contact, it is uh, impossible to point out the manifestation of feeling. 
when there is no manifestation of feeling, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is no manifestation of perception, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is no th manifestation of thinking, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of uh, besetment by perceptions and notions for notion born of manifestation of proliferation. Now, what does it mean if there is no I? Does that mean that one is one should be blind? No, I means one should be deaf. Uh, no nose means born without nose. No tongue means without tongue. No body means without body. What does it mean? If that's the case, then the blind would be not proliferated. Deaf may not be proliferated. That means desire, this is very important point to remember. When there is no desire, the first underlying tendency called lust, underlying tendency to lust. If it is not there, whole series of future things will not arise. <coughs> it is not that we have to be blind, but when we see objects, if we remain, this is a wonderful way of meditating. This is a meditation technique. It's a very profound way of meditating. When the eyes come in contact with a form, eye consciousness arises, eye contact arises, feeling arises, perception arises. At that time, if we do not have lust, then the mental proliferation does not arise. If he does not have, if he do not have lust, underlying tendency to lust, we should not arouse. For that we have to have a very powerful mindful state. We have to be mindful. Underlying tendency. Uh, There's another level called asava level. Anusaya, underlying tendency. The second or upper level is asava. Asava means influx. Asava is something that always flowing, coming like a water on a waterfall. It keeps falling, 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 coming, influx. That has been brewed in our mind for a long period of time. We have, we have brewed, like we brew our tea or fermented. I think what better term is fermented. We have fermented the lust or desire for long period of time, let alone samsara. But even in this life, from the time we were born, we nourished our desire. You know, we call uh, when little time little babies, innocent babies, they are not innocent. They are a bunch of lust, <laughs> greed, embodiment of greed. 
Mothers know that. Fathers know that. Always greedy. So the greed is there. We breed greed. <laughs> From the moment we are born, we breed greed. We ferment greed. Multiply greed. And that's called our server. Our server. Lowest level, the deepest level is Anusaya. And little gross level is our server. Even the still more gross level is called uh, what do you call uh, uh, Sanyojana. Sanyojana. Sanyojanas are very, very powerful because they have support, they have support from Anusaya and Asura. <laughs> Sanyojana has been nourished by Anusaya and Asura. Underlying tendencies and this fermentation. Nourished. Therefore, Sanyojana remains very, very powerful. Very powerful. And as long as Sanyojana, this uh, fetus, they call fetus in English, fetus, not fatter, not fatter. <laughs> fatter can make us fatter. <laughs> so, so long as fetters are there, hindrances are there. Hindrances are the manifestation of fetus. It is just like a tiny little plant on the ground. In desert, you can see desert, very short plants. But when you dig the plant, there's a big root, this big root, or network of roots. As long as those network of roots exist, this sprout, these plants exist. So we temporarily can cut these hindrances through meditation. As I mentioned in my instruction earlier, when you practice jhana, either you can suppress them, you know, for a certain period of time, and when you come out of jhana, they again arise again. You cut them off again, and then they rise again. And then you cut them off by using your jhana, concentration, hindrances, suppress. Suppressing hindrances is the main function of jhana. As long as they are not working, not active, you gain concentration. Greed is not there. Resentment is not there. Sleepiness and drowsiness is not there. Restlessness and worry is not there. Doubt is not there. These are the things that arise anytime, very often, very quickly. As soon as you gain concentration, you suppress. But underneath these hindrances, there is a huge network of Fetters. Underneath fetters, there is another network of asavas, fermentations, influxes. Underneath influxes, there is anusaya, underlying tendencies. So just imagine if you put your hand, this anusaya, underlying tendencies, then Asaya, fetters, and then you draw a line. Above that are hindrances. Little, 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 little plants. You dig it, then fetters, asavas, and unsayas. 
when we attain liberation, <coughs> the first level of liberation called stream entry, you destroy three of these fetters. Three of these fetters. When you attain the last stage of enlightenment, you destroy all the our servers. That's called our server K Jnana. Buddha never mentioned Anusaya K Jnana. That's very interesting. He doesn't mention Anusaya K Jnana. He says our server K Jnana. We destroy our server, that fermentation, influxes. Once we destroy them, those underlying tendencies and fetters, hindrances, all will disappear. And therefore, what I want to mention is uh, no I does not mean that we become blind. No I means we don't de develop desire through the I. We don't develop or arouse our desire through the ear, nor through the nose, tongue, body and mind. When we encounter objects, the real meditator practicing mindfulness become my, immediately become mindful to check the desire from arising. And that is what it means when there is no I, when there is no ear, when there is no, uh, what you call, nose, when there is no tongue, when there is no body, when there is no mind, meaning when there is no desire arising through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. All the tendencies, all the, anus, uh, the fetters, all the hindrances, all will completely cease to exist, cease to exist. So, when this was delivered, the bhikkhus were very, very happy and they listened to it, not like us, they listened to the discourse with bending ears, paying total attention and absorbed every tiny little bit of it. And they felt that they are drinking honey. So when they went back to the Buddha and reported this, Venupa Ananda said, um, Venupa Mahakachan said such and such, it was such a wonderful, beautiful. Venupa said, it's, it sounds like it's drinking honey. What should we call this discourse? Buddha said, then call it a honey ball. <laughs> Call it honey ball. That is how this title came to this discourse. Madhu Pindika Sutta. I think, friends, my time is up and uh, I'll give another talk tomorrow. Uh, this time, little, little mess. By the way, meditation instruction will be exactly the same. Because my belief is that when I want you to dig 100 feet to get water, you can cheat me by telling, by digging 10 holes, each 10 feet. Then you say, I dug 100 feet. I did not get water. I asked you to dig 100 feet in one place, not in 10 places. Only when you dig 100 feet in one place, you can get water. <laughs> By digging 10 places, you cannot get water. I follow that principle. 
Therefore, I repeat the same instruction every day until you get water. <laughs>